today we are talking about the flyback converter in discontinuous conduction mode and we're going to derive the voltage balance equation. We're going to use power balance to look at the relationship between the input and the output and use that to figure out the output voltage in, th in terms of things that we already know about the converter. So let's set that up and see what we can do. The power in and the power out have to balance assuming that everything is ideal. We can describe the output power as this voltage V out, because this is over the load, it's over a resistive load. So we can put that directly as V out, I'm just going to use a capital here because it's a DC, divided by R, and we're going to square this V out, so it's V out squared over R is the output power. Then we want to look at the input power. Well, the input power is going to be the input voltage times the input current. The input voltage we know is VI already here. Good. But what's the other part? The input current. That's not quite as obvious by just looking at this. So let's just write I, the average of I, in here, and we'll have to find a way to solve for this equation. All right, so what would the input current be? Well, the input current is this current coming in here. Notice it's actually going to be the same as IS, the switch current through the switch. And in some parts, when the switch is on in phase one, the input current will be exactly the same as the magnetizing inductance, because we are going through this way on the input. So if we look at our magnetizing inductance here, this is the purple line in DCM, so it starts from zero, goes up to a peak, comes down, hits zero again, and stays at zero for a small time period. So we know during the first phase, this is phase one here, it's gonna be exactly the same. So we've drawn this green dotted line here to follow that one. And after that, when the switch opens again, opens, when it opens, there's no way that current can flow through this input current, so it's going to be just zero until the end of the period. So this would be the rest of the phase here. All right, so we have some charge here, and we want to figure out how to get the average current. Well, we have a triangle of charge here, and if we take this whole charge and then divide it by the total period, we'll get the average current. So now we just need to figure out this triangle of current, and we can call this Q. We need to figure out the charge here. And so we'll need to know the base, which we know here, that's DT, and we'll need to know the height. That's this point. Valerie is showing us right at the peak where we need to be. So what is this point, the maximum that Valerie is sitting on? So we need the peak value here. So I'm going to call this I peak. I may have switched my lowercases and uppercases in other videos. Sorry, we're going with lowercase today. So the peak value, well, we need to look at the inductor equation. So always V equals L, DI, DT. Just memorize that. It's like poetry. Beautiful. And now we can look at the discrete part. So because in phase one, the voltage is constant, we can change this into V. And let's just put in the value. So V here, looking at phase one is input, VI. And we have an L, it's LM, we'll put a little M here. And we have delta I, so that's how much the current is gonna go up, so actually that's gonna be our peak value. And then we're gonna have a DT, and so that DT is gonna be this time here, oh sorry, yeah, DT as in little DT, also big D, capital T. So let's put that here. Okay, and then we can replace this delta I as I peak. So I peak is going to be equal to input current, input, input voltage times D times T divided by LM. Not too bad. So now we have this peak value, and now we want to go back and get the average value of I in. And um, remember, it follows this, goes all the way down to zero. So we want to get this Q. So it would be the Q, the charge, divided by the time. And the Q here, this area, is a triangle. So it's going to be 1 half base times height. 
divided by that total period. And we can now fill in the values for that. So we'll start with, uh, I'll move the, the two down here and we'll do the T at the bottom. So the base again is gonna be the DT. And then the height is the I peak. So we just did this one, so it's over here. And now we have to put in some values here. So it's gonna be VI. I'll write it all out and then we'll condense it. D, T, and we have an outline at the bottom. We can put that right down here. All right, we notice we have some Ds and Ts that are common here, so let's throw those together. So we have a D squared. Oh, also we have, let's actually get rid of one of these Ts first. Get rid of that, so then we have VI. Then we multiply by the T and the 2LM. So this is the average input current here. And now we throw that back into here, substitute it here. And now we can try to rearrange our equation. So let's continue on the left side here. We have VI, and we're gonna multiply by the average value here, so include that. So we're gonna get a D squared. We're getting another VI, so I'm gonna square this here. T over two LM equals V out squared over R. I'm gonna move this R directly over here, so we're gonna put it at the beginning here, R here so that we can now take the square root of this V out, because we want V out obviously not as a square, just as its value. So we're gonna take the square root of this and this one. Whenever we take a square root, we need to check there are gonna be two solutions, right? So we might have, a, we will have a positive and maybe we'd have a negative, right? Do we have a negative? We have to think about what does negative mean in this context? So mathematically there's two solutions, but does the math make sense in real life? It's always about applying that. Hmm, based on the voltage here, could we have a reverse polarity? The answer is no, because of the way that the diode is going, the diode can only allow current to flow in this direction. So it can't go backwards, so we cannot flip the polarity on the output. So it's a mathematical solution, but not a real solution. So just the positive is going to come through, so it makes our answer a little bit easier. So at the end, we have V out equals, well, we have some square roots. Let's put everything together. VI squared, D squared, RT over two L, and M is just a little M for the magnetizing inductance. So our final, final solution is V out equals, we have VI D square root RT over 2LM. So this is the voltage relationship. We know the input current, the duty ratio, the resistor, output resistor, the time period, and the magnetizing inductance value. So to summarize, this is the equation you can use for a flyback converter. It is based on the duty ratio and the input voltage, which is the same as in CCM, but it's not the same as CCM. We also need to know the resistor, the time period, and the magnetizing inductance. So those three values will also affect our output voltage when it's operating in discontinuous conduction mode. The other thing that you may notice is that this is exactly the same as the buck boost converter. How can that be? There's no N in this equation, right? The flyback converter has an N, it has a turns ratio, but we don't see that in this output equation. But it's because of power balance, because the input of this flyback is exactly the same as the input of the buck boost converter. And regardless of the turns ratio, the power has to balance. So when it's in DCM, this is the, the equation that affects it assuming everything's ideal. So theoretically, this is exactly the same as the buck boost converter in DCM, but when it switches into CCM, we do get a different equation. All right, so this is flyback converter, it's pretty cool. And this is the ideal voltage relationship between the input and the output.